Well, no, Charlie, I didn't even ask him. We don't need Potter over here. And I'll take mine now. No, but you're... You're, you're, you're thinking of this place all wrong, as if I had the money back in a safe. I, the, the money's not here. Well, your money's in Joe's house. That's right next to yours. And in the Kennedy house, and Mrs. Maitland's house, and a and hundred others. If you were to counterfeit some US dollars at home right now, you could be punished for up to 20 years in prison with a fine up to $250,000. Yet in the world of finance, banks are not only able to print money, but they're actually encouraged by the government to do so. Banking is one of the least understood businesses throughout history, and yet they are the very places that people dump their life savings into. Hey, we can just put that into your retirement account and make it go to work for you, and it's gone. What? And the more you look into it, the more absurd you realize it really is. So how does the business of banking really work? It's actually not as complicated as you may think. What's the purpose of a bank in the first place? For most of us, it's to have a safe, convenient place to store our money so we don't have to carry around cash. But bankers don't open up a bank out of the kindness of their hearts just to make our lives easier. No, at the end of the day, the purpose of a bank is the same as any other business, to make the owner's money. And the name of the game in banking is collecting interest. Whether that be from credit cards, mortgages, loans to other businesses, the more loans that they have and the higher the interest rate, the more money banks make. But loans aren't anything special and the fact that they want to make money doesn't necessarily make them bad either. After all, our modern lives today wouldn't exist at all if it wasn't for the value that businesses provided. But unlike any other business model out there, banks are the only ones that are legally able to print money out of thin air. In ancient times, the dreams of alchemists was to find a way to turn lead into gold. Whoever would discover that formula would basically control all of the world's money by just creating more gold. Today, it's a little bit different because the world doesn't base its money on gold anymore. In fact, money isn't really based on anything anymore. It's what's called fiat money. Money that's really nothing more than paper that the government says is money. And we use this paper money because we believe in the government and the economy enough that tomorrow we can exchange our money for something like the new Call of Duty Modern Warfare game that I've been playing way too much of recently. And it's in this fiat money system that bankers have become the modern day alchemists with the ability to literally create money out of nothing. And when you get past all the technical jargon, the process is actually not all that complicated and the magic happens every time you deposit money into your bank account. Here's how it works. Let's say you get a paycheck for $10,000 and you deposit it into your bank account. Now, even though the only reason you deposit your money in a bank in the first place is because you expect to take out that money to use later, banks are required by law to only keep around 10% of that $10,000 you deposited as reserves. That means out of the $10,000 you deposited, the bank has the power to take $9,000 of your money and lend it out to other people as loans. And if you understand that short little scenario, you understand how banks print money in a nutshell. Wait, really? That's it? Still a little confused? Let's rewind. Let's pretend only you, the bank, and the person the bank lent your money to, Frank, exist in this imaginary world. You start out with your $10,000, the bank and Frank have $0, so the total amount of money in circulation or the money supply is only $10,000. You deposit your money into the bank because you don't want to be walking around with $10,000 in cash and you don't think stuffing it in your mattress is a very good idea. You're not giving the bank your money, you're just letting them hang on to it so that you have some convenience and peace of mind that you can use that money later whenever you want. But since banks are businesses that are here to make money and that they only have to keep only 10% of the money they get in reserves, why would they just let your money sit there when it could be out collecting interest for them and making them money? And so this bank says, look, we are in a world where our reserve requirement is 10%, which says that the bank only has to keep 10% of these cash reserves and then it can loan out the rest. And so it does that. That's its business model or a significant part of its business model. So they lend out 90% of your money or $9,000 as a loan to Frank at a 5% interest rate so that Frank could start his door-to-door -door kitchen knife sales business. Feast your eyes. 
on your new business. Knives. All of a sudden, Frank has $9,000 to spend. You still have your $10,000 as digits on your online bank statement that you can still take out and spend. And what started out as $10,000 in the money supply has magically increased to $19,000. And the bank, they get to collect 5% in interest or $450 every year for the $9,000 they created for Frank from the money they got from you. Let me repeat that. The bank makes money by lending out money that they created out of thin air from your money. I don't know about you, but maybe I should just quit YouTube and start a bank. But before you do anything rash, there's more. It gets even better because Frank is also like you. He doesn't want to keep his money in his mattress, so what does he do? Before spending it, the $9,000 loan he got goes directly into his bank account. And guess what? Since the bank is there to make money and they only have to keep 10% of Frank's money in reserves, now they can take 90% of Frank's $9,000 deposit, which was based on your deposit, and take that $8,100 and lend that out to other people and collect interest on that money. And when that second loan is created from Frank's deposit, the money supply jumps from $19,000 after the first loan to $27,100 with that second loan. And who has the pleasure of collecting all that sweet interest on all of these loans? The banks. Extrapolate this very oversimplified process out to the entire country and the world and you have the modern banking system of fractional reserve banking, where banks are only required to keep a certain fraction of the deposits that they get in reserves and they can lend out the rest to make money. And since the people who deposited their money into the bank have a right to use that money and take it out whenever they want, even though the bank lent out their money to other people, the money that they lent out is basically money that they created out of nothing that they get to collect interest on. And that is what makes banking so powerful. In no other industry do people enthusiastically hand over their life savings to you so that you can legally create more money and then collect interest on the money you just created. And to see what this looks like in real life, the biggest public bank in the US right now is JP Morgan Chase. And in 2018 alone, they collected $77.44 billion in just interest alone. Now some of you may be wondering, but if banks only have to keep 10% of the money they get from customers, what if the customers want to withdraw more than 10% of their deposits? What happens then? This has actually been a problem throughout the history of banking with what are known as bank runs. Bank runs are almost inevitable with fractional reserve banking because at the end of the day, people are going to eventually want their money back. So to mitigate this, the government put together the FDIC to guarantee people that if the bank can't give their deposits back to them, they'll be insured for up to $250,000 for each person at each bank. On the surface, this sounds really good as a customer of the bank. Sure, the bank is making money with your money, but at least your money is guaranteed by the government. But it also poses another huge benefit to the business of banking. From their perspective, if depositors are always guaranteed by the government to get their money back, where is the incentive for banks to act ethically with their customers' money? What's stopping them from being as risky as possible so that they can make as much money as possible, when worst case scenario, they'll be bailed out by the government? So how absurd is the business of banking? Well, when you consider that we willingly hand them all of our money, they create more money out of nothing, they lend out that made up money to collect interest to make more money for themselves, and it's guaranteed by the government, it's, it's pretty absurd. Our entire working lives are centered in one way, shape, or form around us making money. So isn't it interesting that you had to learn about this thing called fractional reserve banking that pretty much runs the entire world from a free YouTube video? Isn't it interesting that this thing that is part of the backbone and foundation of how the world economy works isn't part of the public school curriculum? It actually wasn't always like this. Back during the early presidential elections of the US, banking was a big issue that was understood by the public and can be compared to modern day issues we're familiar with today like war and climate change. But somehow that faded with the passing of time. I think especially if you want to make money, it becomes even more important to understand how money works, where it comes from, and what people are doing with your money. 
And really guys, we've barely scratched the surface of the monetary world in this video, and this is a topic that I'm really going deep into right now. So if you want to learn more, let me know in the comments down below, and I'll definitely make some more videos for you guys. Hey you, you're a part of the Watch the End Club. But in all seriousness, guys, thank you so much for watching to the very end. And we actually haven't done this in a while, so go ahead and leave in the comments down below if you're watching this right now, hashtag I watch to the very end. It's a really simple thing that you guys can do to help out the YouTube algorithm to give it a nice little boost. And if you enjoy the style of video for the entrepreneur niche, please consider subscribing and turning on that notification bell so YouTube notifies you whenever I release a new video. Uh, da -da -da. What else? Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at jaketrend.io. And yeah, that's gonna wrap it up. You've been awesome, I've been Jake. I'll see you guys in the next one.